The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And firstly, I cannot believe there's so many people here. Yeah. Not only is this the last talk of the last day, but I, I found out that a couple of hours ago there was a talk on almost exactly the same topic. So, you know, thanks very much for coming. And I really appreciate it. This is, all, this is a talk all about how to learn Arabic dialects. But just before I get started, I just want to clarify um, a couple of things. First of all, um, I don't consider myself an expert in Arabic at all. Uh, I hope to become one, but at this stage, this is going to be a talk all about uh, my experiences of, of understanding Arabic and getting used to what exactly Arabic is since I moved to Cairo in Egypt last September. Also, I've got a lot of lovely images in this presentation. Not all of them are mine. I just wanted to make clear that they're all licensed under Creative Commons. And so if you'd like to get the links to any of the images, I'm going to make the presentation available on my website so you can download that and, and check them out. So, first of all, this word, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say anything about it. But I'd like you just to turn to the person next to you and tell them what comes to mind for you when you see this word. Okay, let's just take a couple of ideas. Someone just shout out whatever, you, whatever, whatever you'd like to share, and I'll repeat it so that everyone can hear. Arab people. Arab people. <laughs> Good. Hummus. The script. The script. The many Arabic languages. The many Arabic languages. Plural. Plural. Yeah. Sorry. Clothing. Okay. Yeah, because what, what, see, what I found is when I, when I started, since I started talking about Arabic and writing about Arabic, I, I just get, I get met with a flood of confusion from, from so many different places. And I think there is a, a lot of ambiguity around Arabic, and especially the Arabic language, and exactly what it is. Um, so that's kind of what I hope to address in this talk a little bit, for people who are not familiar with Arabic. Well, what is it? And what do you need to know as someone that, needs, that wants to actually learn the language? So I've heard a few things here, from hummus to, um, to clothes to, to the script. Let me show you what comes to my mind when I think of this word. <laughs> so I imagine that you know, some of these you might have been expecting, some of these, some of these perhaps not expecting so much. Um, and the, I think the, the, the main thing about Arabic is the chances are that whatever your perception of Arabic is, it's almost certainly very, very different to what an Arabic person or the locals in Arabic countries conceive of Arabic as being. And specifically, as you might have guessed from the topic of this talk, the main thing that we need to clear up is the difference between Arabic and Arabic dialects. And this talk is all about Arabic dialects and exactly what that is. So, here's a guy from Egypt. If you asked him what Arabic is, what do you think he'd say? My language. My language. <coughs> Fusha. Fusha. <coughs> so different kinds of Arabic. Different kinds of Arabic, okay. So the chances are that if you, if you sat down with this guy and said, look, what is Arabic? He would probably tell you two things, the first of which being Quranic Arabic or Classical Arabic, both the same thing. The language, the origin of the language, from the religious text, the, the kind of foundation of the whole Arabic culture, language and religion. He might also talk to you about this, Modern Standard Arabic, or MSA. Any ideas what this is? Egyptian. Not Egyptian, no. Media. Members of the media, okay. Yeah, uh, not exactly. This, so modern standard Arabic is the closest that you get to an official Arabic language. Okay, so as the picture suggests, if you pick up a newspaper written in Arabic, this is what you're going to see. 
if you watch the news, the TV news, this is the language that you're going to hear spoken. If you work in some certain government offices, you might speak with other officials, perhaps, in, in this language. And so this is essentially derived from classical Arabic. It borrows a lot of the same grammatical constructions, a lot of the same vocabulary. But it's also borrowed quite heavily from the dialects that you have around the Arab world. It borrows, it has a lot of some of the more modern concepts that wouldn't have existed back in the time of classical Arabic. So this guy would have told you that for him, Arabic is classical Arabic and modern standard Arabic. These are obviously not the, the, the exact words that he would use in Arabic, but that's the, the, how they're known in English. So I've got a question for you. How many countries, in how many countries around the world, is modern standard Arabic an official language? Not necessarily the primary language, but an official language. What would you think? Oh, okay. I heard zero. Eight. Eight. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Pretty good. It's actually twenty-seven. Twenty-seven languages, uh, twenty-seven countries in the Middle East and North Africa have modern standard Arabic as an official uh, language. Two hundred and ninety million people. It's a lot of people have uh, modern standard Arabic as their official language. So on the face of it, it seems simple, right? You want to learn Arabic. This is the language you learn, right? I mean, it's the official language of, of all these countries. <coughs> and yet, as we're going to look at now, this is really where a lot of the confusion starts. Before I started this talk, when I started sort of thinking about what I was going to talk about, I went to the Facebook group of the, of the Polyglot Gathering, and I just posted a question, and I said, hey guys, I'm going to talk about Arabic. What do you want to know? Give me your questions. And these are the kind of questions that I got. Can I learn Egyptian without studying Standard Arabic? I heard I should skip modern Standard Arabic and go straight to dialect. And then the other side of the coin, I would prefer to learn modern Standard Arabic, but is there any sense in that? So these are the kind of questions and the kind of, um, the kind of confusion that, that arises and possibly some of the things that you might be thinking um, right now. So let's explain. For Arabic people, on the whole, and this is of course a generalization, as we said before, modern standard Arabic, this is what they would consider to be Arabic. Can, this is the cultural, their cultural heritage. And if you ask this guy, hey, I'm from the UK, I want to learn Arabic, what should I learn? What's he going to tell me? The same thing, yeah. On the whole, of all the people I've ever spoken to, you know, I would say at least 90% of people say you have to learn modern standard Arabic because this is Arabic. But what language does he speak on a daily basis with his friends and family at work? Does he speak modern standard Arabic? No. What does he speak? Egyptian. He's from Egypt. He speaks the Egyptian dialect of, uh, of Arabic. So what does that mean exactly? Well, basically... It's, very, it's closely related to, to modern standard Arabic, but dialects, as in, in all places, you have a lot of idiosyncrasies uh, from the local region. So they have their own words for lots of different things, some slightly different grammar, uh, obviously a certain accent. Every country has its own accent. And, and so, yeah, he would tell you to learn something, essentially, that he does not speak himself. And this is where the sort of confusion comes in. So let's talk a little bit about what, how this actually might manifest itself, because it's quite confusing, isn't it? This, this, is, uh, this is Magdi. He's, um, he's a good friend of mine. He runs the, I don't know if Jan's here, but he, Jan met, met him uh, when he came to visit in Cairo. Um, he runs the local shop right around the corner from where I live in Cairo with his son Adam. And um, we, uh, we have a good chat every day. When I get back from work, I stop in and buy a few things. And, and we, we have a chat, and we would talk in, what would you expect? In Egyptian Arabic, exactly. So you know, we're having a chat, and then I, eventually I'm going to go in, I'm going I'm to pick up a few things that I want to buy from the shop, and I'm going to take them to the, to the till, and I'm gonna, you know, he's going to add it all up, and he's going to tell me how much money I owe him. So we're talking all this time in Egyptian Arabic, and then when it comes time to give me the bill, and to tell me how much money I need to give him, can you guess what happens? He switches, and he would tell me the amount of money that he wants me to give him, the total of the bill, in modern standard Arabic. And at first I just didn't know what he was talking about because I hadn't, I hadn't really touched modern standard Arabic, so I didn't know the numbers. So can you, 
Why would you think that this would happen? Why would he do that? Sorry? Official transaction, yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. That's, yeah. Because he's reading. He's reading the numbers. Because he's reading the numbers. Well, you do it. You can you say the numbers in, in, in the dialects as well. The point is that this is, you know, when it comes down to money, it's, you know, money is a, is a, is a difficult, you know, it's a touchy subject in a lot of cases, isn't it? And it's not something to be taken lightly. And, oh, sorry, I'll click back. And so when it comes time to talk about money, he thinks to himself, right, this is a, a formal situation. I need to behave with, you know, properly. And so he will switch to modern standard Arabic in order just to tell me the amount of money I need to give him. And this gives you a really interesting insight into the way that they, can, they think about these two dialects. Well, the, di the Egyptian dialect and the modern standard Arabic that he knows. So... Again, if modern standard Arabic is important like this, surely this is, this is what we should be learning. This is, if you want to learn Arabic, surely you should learn modern standard Arabic. Because you hear things like this. If you learn modern standard Arabic, you can be understood anywhere in the Arab world by most people. Most people will tell you this. Is it true? No. Well, yeah, actually it is true. On the whole, if you learn to speak modern standard Arabic, then wherever you go in the Arab world, people by and large will understand you. But I want to ask you a question. You're all experienced language learners. Would, how would you feel about wanting to be understood? You know, you're going to learn a new language. How would you feel about wanting to be understood anywhere you go in the Arab world by people who don't speak that language themselves? Is that something you would aspire to? For me, it's not. And the other thing is, for Egyptians, for example, I mean, you, you could say, okay, learn modern standard Arabic, and then you can go anywhere in the Arab world and you'll be fine, people will understand you. What about Egyptians? Take Egyptians as an example. When they go to a different country, when they go to, to Jordan or Morocco, would they suddenly switch into modern standard Arabic and speaking modern standard Arabic? It might depend on the situation they are in. It's possible, yeah, they might. On the whole, you know, I worked in Qatar before, where you have Arabs from all over the, all over the Middle East and North Africa. And on the whole, they will speak to each other in their own dialect, and it's more or less mutually intelligible, with you know, with some exceptions. I've I've heard actually plenty of stories of people who have gone abroad to places like Egypt and Syria, and they've and they've done you know intensive Arabic courses. They've been studying modern, modern standard Arabic for a long time. They've got to a very good level, and yet they'll tell me that when they walk down onto the street and they ask someone directions to the local cinema or something that person will actually turn around and laugh in their face. Because it's, it's that foreign to them in terms of something that you would speak on a daily basis. Now, obviously, this is an extreme example, but it's, I've, I've heard these anecdotes quite a few times. So when I think about this issue, for me, the distinction between modern standard Arabic and a dialect, I think, I, for me, it always comes down to people. Just like Claudio was saying in the last talk, for him, it's all about people and wanting to understand the conversation on the street. And for me, this is exactly what it is. This is Nada. She's one of my best friends in Egypt. She teaches me Arabic as well. And she, for me, is what it means to me to learn Arabic. She's a real person with a real family, with real friends, with a real life, a real job, her own share of tragedies in her own, in her own personal life as well. And what, when I think, well, what language does she speak? She speaks the Egyptian dialect of Arabic, and that's, so, that's what I want to learn in order to be able to communicate with, with my friend. And so, for me, when I think about this whole issue, it is the dialect that I want to learn to be able to speak every day with the people that are, that are around me. Now, I can't tell you what the right answer is for you, because we, we all have different situations. If you are, have a particular academic interest in, in, uh, in Arabic, then it may be the case that you, it's better for you to learn classical Arabic or modern standard. All I can tell you is, from a place of, you know, this time last year, when I was utterly confused about what I should be doing, what I should be learning, it's become very clear now, and it, I see the whole issue quite clearly, which is that it's all about whatever the people around me are speaking. And so that's how I, um, that's how I approach this now, how I look at it. And just to put that in perspective, of all of the countries that didn't work as I planned. Of all of the countries um, in the Middle East and North Africa that have 
uh, modern standard Arabic is an official language, and you know what the answer is going to be. Now, how many people actually speak it in their daily lives with their friends and family? None. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of perspective about, about the distinction between modern standard Arabic and, and the dialects and what you might have to think about if you were to, to approach learning Arabic. And it would be really nice if it was that simple, if that was the only thing you have to worry about, but of course it's not. And as a result of, of the things that we've been talking about, there are a lot of other complications as well. So if Arabic is modern standard Arabic and local dialects are simply the sp a spoken form, what happens to reading and writing in a dialect? If you're in Egypt and you're learning Egyptian Arabic, it's the case that you will almost never see Egyptian Arabic written down anywhere. Whenever you see official doc, like when I'm at work, for example, and I need to, I need, I need to produce an official document for something in Arabic, I have to produce it in modern standard Arabic. Whenever you see uh, writing anywhere around, it's almost always in modern standard Arabic. And so when you, if you did want to write down Egyptian dialect, and you can do it, it's only ever an approximation at best. What people do is they take the writing system from modern standard Arabic and they use their knowledge of the sounds and the letters and they kind of guess how that would translate into what they would say in their own dialect. So it's this kind of crazy situation where you've got people that speak a language every day and yet there's no standardised form of actually writing it. And so think, as a learner of this language that is almost never written down, what are the implications for you as a learner of the language? Lack of resources. There is, there's virtually no material for, no good material for learners of Arabic dialects. There are a couple of, a couple of textbooks of varying quality, um, but in general, if you want to have any kind of authentic material or, or any kind of resources out there for learning the language, there's very, very little out there at all. And that presents a real problem for you if, when you actually set about learning um, to learning to speak and to read the dialect. And so what happens is you, you, you get things like this and people have other, people start to develop other ways of uh, actually writing down the language. And so you have an Arabic sentence here. And what happens with the young, young people, especially now around, the, around, the, around the, the whole Arab world, start to use uh, a different system to, to write. And they use this thing called Franco-Arabic alphabet. So this reading from right to left in in Arabic, and then left to right with the English transcription. And people develop this system because it's a lot more convenient, not only when they're texting on their phones, but when they're writing on Facebook and things like that. So as a result of this diff general difficulty in writing down your own language, they develop this different system for communicating. And like this, there are a few others as well. The Franco-Arabic alphabet is also incredibly, uh, what's the word? It has only certain relations to the, to the original words themselves. So what happens is you get these kind of questions coming back like this. People who are learning Arabic and they, and they come across stuff written in Franco-Arabic or even in dialect, they say, well, I can't figure out the original Arabic word because whatever they write down in the Franco-Arabic alphabet is only, you know, it's not accurate. It's not an accurate transliteration of the original Arabic word. They also say things like, well, I can actually read Arabic, but people online want to write in the Latin alphabet. And so, for a learner, it's... Yeah, go ahead. In this context, when you say Arabic, are you referring to just the dialect or anything? Well, in this, in, okay, in this particular context, this is... <laughs> that explosion is going to come back and haunt me. Um, this is actually... this is. Egyptian Arabic that's written here, okay? which is, again, it's an approximation of what the person wants to say using the Arabic script. And then this is exactly the same thing written in, uh, in the Franco-Arabic alphabet. Does that answer your question? So when, you, when the person says, I can't figure out the Arabic word, you mean, I can't just figure out the Egyptian word, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So you get these, 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 these problems coming out. 
And so as a learner of a dialect, you're going to encounter this all the time. If you go onto Facebook, most people are going to be writing on writing in, uh, in the Franco-Arabic alphabet. So in terms of my own case, when I was sort of trying to figure this out, when I was starting to learn Arabic and, and trying to figure out all these things, oh, should I learn modern standard Arabic? Should I learn Egyptian dialect? Should I learn to write with the script? Or should I use Franco-Arabic? There's all these, all these incredibly difficult questions and, and very few answers out there. What I actually did myself was when I started learning, I used the Franco-Arabic alphabet. Because for me, it's all, it's all about the, the speaking. I want to be able to sit down and speak with people. And so as I'm sitting down with my tutors and I'm, and I'm having these conversations, what I, like, what I would like to do is to write down as much as possible. And I couldn't do it in the Arabic script because I, I hadn't learned it particularly well at that point and it was also very slow. So I started using the Franco-Arabic alphabet to kind of write down everything and make sure I had a record of, um, of, the, of the things that were being said and the things that I wanted to say. Whenever I used my flashcards, I also used the, used the Franco-Arabic alphabet for that. Above all, it was, it was convenience, I'd say, more than anything else. And, but it worked well for me, because what it meant was I was able to start speaking with people, and I was able to, uh, you know, just be able to actually write stuff down. You know, if, any of, if, you, if any of you have learnt Japanese or Chinese, for example, or another language with a very different alphabet, you'll be familiar with that, with that issue of wanting to speak with people, wanting to write stuff down, but not being competent yet in the script. So it was a really good start for me, but what I found was, after I started to be able to communicate fairly well with, with, with people, I kind of reached this ceiling, because I realised that the Franco-Arabic alphabet, because it's only, a, again, an approximation, you're just missing out on a lot, of, a lot of foundation. And so what I started to do was then I went back and, uh, and I learned to read and write the Arabic script properly, and I started using uh, textbooks as well to try and develop a little bit of a, of a foundation. But it's really, really difficult because I was just kind of figuring this out all along. And all the time, everyone was saying to me, oh, you should just learn modern standard Arabic. What are you learning this dialect for? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. People would tell me this day after day. One of the great... Uh, byproducts of learning to read and write the Arabic script was that I discovered that I absolutely love the Arabic script. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever come across. And both to, to read by itself, but also to write, it's incredibly cathartic. I'm left-handed, so to write from right to left is actually, you know, it's one of the, one of the sort of, it's an absolute revelation. I just think, well, why couldn't English be like this? You ever seen those pictures of Obama writing with his, his wrist around like that? I do the same thing. But, in, but I, I find it quite easy to write in Arabic because it's just perfectly natural. So I just found myself falling in love with the Arabic script and, and the different ways of, um, of actually representing it. <coughs> and it, it's been one of, the most, one, of the, one of the nicest things actually so far about discovering Arabic for me. And so back to this problem of, well, if you don't have the resources and you don't know how to write, well, how do you actually learn? And for me, it comes down to this kind of dichotomy. Are you learning to speak, or are you speaking to learn? And based on what I've been telling you so far, you might be able to guess that it's, uh, it's this. I found myself speaking to learn. And what I mean by that is it's very difficult to learn to speak because you don't have those resources to build your foundation. But by going out there and actually speaking, you, obviously, you, know, you get feedback, you learn lessons, you, 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 you learn vocabulary, maybe you know, at different rates. So by actually going out and speaking, this was my way of kind of creating my, 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 my own materials. And I, I honestly don't know why there's such a lack of materials, because with 320 million people out there, you might expect someone to have thought, well, hang on, maybe we should put together some decent materials. And I think, you know, if anyone's looking to make their fortune in foreign language materials, then uh, Arabic dialects is certainly something to consider. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult for beginners, and textbooks on the whole are very difficult to use. The ones that, that do exist, uh, generally have no English, so you can't even look at them without the, without the help of a teacher. So this is what I did. I, I kind of went out there and I just started to kind of track people down, find people who were interested and willing to talk to me. There weren't many of them, but I found some of them. And I just started to go out there and have these just, reg I just regular speaking sessions. I tried to organise at least two, but up to you know three or four sessions in a week and I just sit down and I just talk and at the beginning it's painful. It's, it's really, really hard. You, know, you don't understand anything but you, kind of, you know what it's like, you just push through. 
And so I'm speaking as much as possible, and I'm just writing stuff down. I mean, you can see here my sort of efforts to try to, to write, stuff, write stuff down, and maybe not on this page, but you can see these kind of weird mixes of, of, uh, of, of Arabic script and, and mostly Franco-Arabic that I'm, that I'm using here. And so gradually, by this, this kind of painful process of having no materials and yet trying to go out there and create my own and speak with people, you know, it's, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'd recommend this part to anyone else, but it does kind of eventually come together. And you, you know, after, I always tend to find that after about six months, things of doing something regularly, things do tend to kind of take shape. And that's certainly what I found with, with Arabic as well. So then, what would I say to people? What would be my, my, my main advice for people who want to go out there and learn Arabic dialects? Um, I don't know if you can see this at the back, it's rather small, so I'll, I'll read it out for you. So, first of all, I'd say that if you have any ambitions of actually wanting to go to the Arab world and speak with people, then I would say you absolutely must learn a dialect. I don't see it making much sense at all for anybody to learn modern standard Arabic unless, A, uh, time is no object, and, or B, you, you have a different kind of interest. You're, you're particularly interested in the script, or you have an academic um, or cultural interest, and you're studying uh, remotely. I'd say, based on my experience, if I could go back and do it again, I would learn to read and write from the start. Seems obvious with hindsight, really, but for some reason I didn't. I just kind of went at it and used the Franco-Arabic alphabet. You can learn to read and write Arabic in a few hours, actually. It's not that hard. Um, you might not learn all the rules, but you could certainly learn all the letters and the, and the basic shapes um, in a matter of hours. And actually, you just got a very good book on, um, on how to... How to uh, read and write Arabic that I used myself and it was a really good help so maybe she can tell you about that later. Um, I'd also say that you absolutely must speak from the start, from day one, because you will not find the materials out there to help you. A, few th a couple of things that helped me in particular, I'd say recording people and transcribing it was very, very helpful. It kind of became my materials really. I'd often just sort of uh, when I would have my, my speaking sessions, I'd just stick my phone on there and just record what was going on. Or sometimes I'd be taking a, a taxi home and I just, taxi drivers always just love talking to me, whether or not I understand a word they're saying. So I actually started to get in taxis and just press the record button on my phone so that I've got some, you know, some stuff recorded there. And then I'd take it to my, to my tutor and I'd say, look, can you transcribe this for me? It's a great, great way to, to, to actually start to develop your own materials because it's the real thing as well, it's the real language, it's what people are speaking every day. I also found italki invaluable and without it I don't think I would have uh, got anywhere near as far as I, as I have. Um, although I've actually, I'm actually lucky enough to have quite a few people around me in Cairo who, who do actually help me and who I can, I can meet regularly, I actually do most of my sessions on italki now just because you know, I can just stay in my pyjamas and have to, <laughs> have to leave the house. So that's been absolutely fantastic. I'd also say if you're starting Arabic, get help with your pronunciation right from the start. It's not easy, especially for, for, for native English speakers. You've got a lot of difficult sounds to learn to pronounce. It's by no means impossible, but you do need to make sure right from the start that you get a good handle on, especially the kind of guttural sounds, the ba and the ba and the ka in, in Arabic that you really need to get right. And then lastly, I would say that even despite all my advice of actually sort of speaking as much as possible and using that as your foundation, I think it is a good idea to source a, a textbook and start to work through it because the one thing I found now that I'm starting to make progress is that I'm really kind of lacking that foundation. And so I would recommend working through a textbook as well. And you're probably going to need a teacher to work through that textbook because of the way that, that Arabic dialect textbooks tend to be. So in terms of recommended materials, here they are. Um, I'm going to put them all on, on, a, on a page on my blog so you can, you can track them down if you need to. We've got the, 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 the best textbooks, and this comes from a very authoritative source, the best textbooks for each of the different uh, dialects, Egyptian, Levantine, modern Ar uh, Iraqi, Moroccan, Syrian, Lebanese, and Gulf Arabic. Again, I'll give you a link where you can, you can find all this stuff. Um, there's a new site that's just will be launched recently, which is very interesting, and I think this is going to make life a lot easier for, for people learning uh, Arabic dialects. It's called Talking Arabic. And what they've got is actually they've got content, so they've got recorded dialogues and videos and scripts and grammar explanations in all the different dialects. So you've got Egyptian Arabic, and you've got Iraqi Arabic, and you've got Moroccan, and so you've got all this stuff there. Uh, you know, all done very, very well, very clean, very easy to to access. 
And I had a word with the creators of this before I came here today, and they've actually very kindly offered to give everyone here six months free to the service. So if you fancy checking it out, I highly recommend it. Just go to my blog, which is iwillteachyourlanguage.com forward slash Arabic offer, and they're going to give you six months free for that. So you know, definitely check that out. So that's pretty much what I wanted to, to cover. Uh, if you'd like to check out the slides uh, for any of these um, the resources that I mentioned, the tips that I've given you, and also the attributions to those images that I used, then you can find all the slides here, I will teach you a language.com forward slash Arabic talk. It's all there. And before I finish, if you have any kind of questions about Arabic in the future, you'd like to ask me anything about Arabic or anything about languages in general, then I've just launched a new podcast. It's called the I Will Teach You a Language podcast, and you can find that on iTunes. And there you can send me any questions you want, and I, and I can answer that. So if any of you are interested in Arabic, that would be a great place to, to get in touch and to, uh, to ask me your questions. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take any questions from people on this topic or anything else. Have you considered uh, learning more than one uh, dialect, or do you know if that is commonly done? I mean, it's common for those of us who do European languages to do French, Spanish, Italian, or Russian, Polish. I mean, is this done in the Arabic world, and have you done it, or are you considering doing it? Um, personally, it's, it's, it's not something I've thought of or probably would consider doing. Um, partly for me, I mean, I'm fairly kind of instrument, I, I take a rather instrumental approach to when I'm learning language. So the only, the only situation I could think of that I would learn Iraqi Arabic, for example, is if I was actually going to go to, to live in, in Iraq. I mean, Egypt, Egyptian Arabic is, is, is unique in that it's probably the most mutually intelligible lang uh, Arabic dialect of all, partly because the Egyptian movie industry is very, very big. So if you speak Egyptian, you're probably the most uh, easily understood of, the, of, 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 of all of the different dialects. I, I mean, do correct me if I'm wrong about that, but that's certainly what I've, what I've heard. In terms of people, in terms of sort of foreigners learning other dialects, I'm sure there will be some. I don't, I haven't uh, seen it as being particularly common. But I mean, because there's such similar languages, I mean, I imagine it would be sort of um, similar to, you know, being Spanish and then learning learning Basque and um, and Catalan. I don't, I don't know. Um, sorry. Well, perhaps not. But you know, this <laughs> oh, is it? okay. Well, fine. Um, that shows you how much I know about Basque. But you get the, but you get the point. It's uh, very close, um, very, very close. So that, yeah, I, that's, that's my, my best answer. Not very good, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Not a question, but a suggestion um, of a resource. Sure. Um, there is a book called Al Kitab. Well, actually, there are many books that are called Al Kitab something, <laughs> which means the book. <laughs> but uh, that one is published by the University of Texas, and um, it focuses on MSA. Uh, well, the first part of it is actually called Alif Ba, uh, and um, it's the, f the first two letters of the Arabic alphabet. Uh, so it covers Fusha, but it also focuses on two main dialects, and that is Egyptian and uh, uh, the one spoken in the Levant, so Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon. So um, that it has a lot of videos, a lot of uh, dialects, like the way people, uh, not dialects, uh, dialogues, <laughs> uh, the way people speak in everyday life. So uh, if you don't want to learn Fusha, just skip that part and focus on the dialect that you like. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much for that. So El Kitab, is that the, yeah. that's the name? Great. Okay, great. Maybe uh, well, I'll add that. I'll add that link to the um, to the resources on the on the website afterwards for anyone that's interested. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, the uh, Langenscheid Praktisches uh, Lehrbuch Arabisch also has uh, first uh, every dialect a dialogue in uh, modern standard Arabic and then in Egyptian and then in Syrian and they have some notes on what makes the Egyptian dialo dialogues different and also all recorded. But what I particularly like about this textbook is the approach taken with the uh, Arabic uh, alphabet and particularly the vowels in that uh, at the in the beginning lessons you have fully vowel texts and then afterwards they kind of leave out the obvious ones like to, to have a short I um, 
uh, indication on the E uh, vowel, and then they leave out uh, all the vowel signs that are um, ah. So it's like kind of like uh, assume that each letter comes with a ah sound and um, read it like that. So you have a text that only has uh, like one or two vowel signs per line, and it's really good to get into uh, reading Arabic without vowels. What was the name of that again? Um, it's the Langenscheid book, a Praktisches Lehrbuch Arabisch. Great, thanks. <laughs> I, I'll put that in the notes. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Far away. Um, first of all, uh, how would Arabs uh, from different parts of the Arab-speaking world communicate together? If you've got an international meeting or something. So that's the first one. And the second one is you mentioned that you only arrived in Egypt in September. And uh, I presume maybe you started from scratch then. I know you're holding yeah. down a full-time job as well. Where I yeah. assume you're working mainly in English. So can you tell us a bit about your learning process, how much time on a typical day or in a typical week you've been devoting to the task? Okay, I, I, I think there are probably people in the room who are more qualified than me to answer how people would uh, communicate when they're abroad in different contexts. I know that in some cases they, they would use modern standard Arabic to communicate together. Um, would, would anyone like to comment on that? Yeah. Okay, I guess. Um, so in really different dialects, like Moroccan, um, uh, yeah, I, friends of mine um, have traveled there, Ar Arab friends, and they used modern standard Arabic, and they got laughed at because they, they, they got teased for sounding like a Mexican soap opera that's been dubbed into modern standard, because I guess that was the most common time Moroccans heard it at the time. But they were, they were understood. What's more common is they have, a, it's called al-Arabi al bayda uh, which means the white Arabic. So when Arabs from different nations come together, they try to use their general awareness of how their dialect is different from the standard, and they, none of them speak modern standard very well, and they're not going to use all the formal cases, but they try to reduce the amount they're using their local slang and local pronunciations and kind of try to meet as close as they can to the middle. They try to neutralize their dialect. And this is a native level skill. Some people might be better at it. Um, than others. I would also, while we're sharing resources, I would also like to add um, another conference participant recommended to me a Syrian colloquial, Ara Syrian colloquial Arabic course. That yeah, that's actually in the list of things. Yeah, okay. I didn't put the cover because it's a website, yeah. uh, but that's on the list. Okay. Of stuff. Yeah. And and I would say that Egyptian or Sy or the Levantine dialect would be kind of equally understood throughout because mm. Egyptians have good movies and Syrians have good TV shows and they're they're both broadcasts everywhere. Um, and then my, my personal favorite resource, which I got stuck in studying only grammar, I don't recommend only using this resource, um, but it's it's called Easy Arabic Grammar. Um, Is that possible? Yes, yes. It's, it's my favorite Arabic resource. It's clear, it's straightforward, it's concise, it's just enough exercises for you to get the concepts. And although it's based in modern standard, it covers most of the foundational grammar, which doesn't really change um, when you trend. Or if it changes, it changes a little bit in pronunciation or it gets simplified. So the book Easy Gr Arabic Grammar, I ran out of time to talk about resources in my talk, so. Uh, Easy Arabic Grammar can give you um, the foundations of uh, of Arabic that are at that level because you're not going too much into the the complex case, cases and such will transfer into the study of Arabic dialects. Cool. So. Yeah, thank you very much. So just um, to answer Gareth's other point, I'm not sure if it was first or second. Yes, I mean my situation was I went to I went to to Cairo in September and yeah, full time job, working a lot, and in English as well. And yeah, I mean you know. Sure, as all of you can relate to, time is all time and energy is always the, the biggest problem of all, isn't it? Um, and so we're kind, of, we're kind of like I said earlier. I mean, my my foundation right from the beginning was just speaking. So right from the first from the first week, I put quite a lot of energy into actually going out there and tracking down uh, local people who were interested in in helping me, and, uh, um, and so I, I paid them. Um, as well, it's not, it's not, not, not very much, um, but, <laughs> but, but the the norm, you know, the average for what people would expect. I mean, they're just kind of sitting down and talking and, you know, getting a coffee out of it as well. But so I'm kind of paying them a fair, a fair, a fair amount, and I would basically aim to have you know, three or four hours of conversation, um, you know, dedicated conversation, face-to-face -face conversation time uh, in a week. So that was the first part, and then I, I do my usual trick, which is just kind of taking uh, from having written down as much as possible from those those conversations is then kind of going through it and being very selective and thinking, right, of all of this stuff that I've written down, what do I really 
need to learn right now, like a sort of 80-20 analysis of, of the stuff that I've written down. And then I, I like using flashcards, so I would transfer the most important stuff into flashcards and then just kind of, you know, hammer away at that in my spare, you know, spare five minutes here and there. But, I mean, that was basically, that, that's basically what, what I did. And, and then uh, only, it was only later down the line that I started uh, kind of using textbooks. But honestly, I mean, just doing that, that one thing, you know, the kind of regular speaking, and it has to be regular and it has to be quite a lot, combined with kind of um, focused vocabulary work with flashcards, th that, that works, you know, whatever language you're learning. And, um, and it, it did the trick for me. At least at the beginning. Now it's getting. Now that I need to kind of build my my foundation a bit more, it's a different story, and I'm spending more time with, with textbooks. But that's what I did at the start. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, do you have any plans to put your notes together and release them as a book or something in the future? Uh, I um, I well, um, who knows? <laughs> I mean, I I um. I did, I did actually start on my blog, I did start to kind of write about these types of things when I first got there. I haven't been very good at keeping it up. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, certainly, I'll certainly make this available and I'll, you know, if there's, if there's enough interest, maybe it would be possible to expand it in the future. Um, but the thing is with me that I'm not, I'm not particularly, um, you know, I, I, I don't really consider myself very... Um, not organized, but who said that? <laughs> um, I don't consider. I, I don't tend to go into massive amounts of depth in a language. I'm quite kind of utilitarian in that in that respect. I like to learn a language to speak it, and I'm always very aware when I come to places like this that there are people that know masses more than me about um, about you know a language and, and um, any, pretty much any language, and uh, so I'm kind of always you know like I say aware that there are people that know are far better than me at this. But um, you know, who knows? I'll, I'll I'll put this up and I'll I'll see what sort of see what the response is, and maybe in the future it will be worth, you know, producing a short short guide. Who knows? <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. One more? I know about your music background, and I wonder you can't split test this, but I wonder if you feel that there's an advantage from knowing how to read music to leap into this kind of script. Or perhaps even a built-in proclivity to be interested in it. It's, a, it's actually quite a common question, you know, what's the link between music and language acquisition? Um, I, I certainly feel that having a musical background helps me with acquiring accents. I think my, I, I, I think my, my accents in my various languages are, are reasonably reasonably good and I think that comes in a large part from uh, having a good ear which obviously is a result of musical uh, training and in terms of reading the script I, I mean I, I don't I'm not sure I'd I can see any particular links to that um, but yeah I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about that Yeah, I mean, so in terms of the kind of language acquisition process, then yeah, I think that there probably are that kind of discipline of sitting in a practice room and, and practicing the same piece, this, you know, the same, um, the same piano sonata over and over again. I mean, that's certainly a discipline. But I mean, your question was specifically about the script, and I, no, I'm not sure I'd see any any um, any link. But you know, who knows? It's not something I've thought about before, so I will. more questions okay thanks very much really appreciate you coming especially at the end of a long weekend thanks very much